we need to find other ways of doing politics which aren't simply um, the kind of just just about electoral ballot you know who wins in the ballot box and aren't simply people shouting at each other on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever and actually create different types of spaces where we we have a much more constructive politics and I think we know we can do that we know we have the capacity to do that it's about whether or not we have the democratic willingness of uh, of elected elected officials and the kind of citizen pressure to actually see a different type of politics emerge i think we know how to do that kind of politics it's about whether or not those people with vested interests in the system uh, are willing to see that change hello and welcome back to different conversations after a series one that was defined by the united kingdom being in lockdown covid 19 and the 2020 summer that was We've decided to start filming season two and immediately we're back into lockdown again. Uh, we didn't coordinate, I promise, but here we are. So we'll be doing weekly podcasts for the next month or two and uh, hopefully you enjoy them. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already, whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening in on iTunes, Spotify, or whichever channel you're finding the audio version of the podcast on. My name's Brad Elliott and with me today, I've got Professor Graham Smith from the Center for the Study of Democracy. Uh, Graham, great to have you with us. Glad to be here. So uh, the reason I wanted to have you on today, uh, Professor Graham Smith, <laughs> Professor of Politics, Director of the Centre for the Study of Democracy, yep. is uh, to peer behind the curtain of how we film this. Today is the, the day of the American election, and the world's been watching this with bated breath for, I feel like since Trump was elected, we've been building yeah. up to today. <laughs> So as, a, as an expert in democracy, uh, are you following along with the presidential election in the States at the moment? I'm following it in the same way that you might be following a show on Netflix or on, uh, you know, it's kind of, it just feels like a, a massive kind of uh, political drama, which, you know, you couldn't possibly have scripted. Um, but like everybody else, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I've, I'm interested, I'm kind of uh, interested, appalled, fascinated, all of those sorts of things at the same time. Because as a, as a person who uh, studies democracy professionally and researches into democracy mm -hmm. professionally, it must have been quite uh, a thing to experience this, to live through this. As you say, it's just been, it seems like, and maybe I'm wrong in terms of my lay understanding of history, if you will, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like this is such a bizarre period for democracy as a form of governance. And it's, it's being challenged a lot. Yeah, it's, it's very, there's always this kind of, I don't know what the term might be, but sort of exceptionalism where we think the times we're living through are, are exceptional. And if you look back at history of American politics, and I should say I'm no expert in American politics. That doesn't stop me having a view about it, of course. But <laughs> if you look back historically in American po uh, politics, you do see these kind of moments where you see populist challenges to, to incumbent, uh, in incumbents. You see... Um, people challenging the system, you see the kinds of um, the, you know, uh, what you might refer to as sort of authoritarian tendencies amongst leaders. So um, America isn't a kind of reg a political regime that has just seen a blossoming of constant blossoming of democracy and then this kind of shock to the system. There are always these kinds of shocks. I'm just reading a book at the moment about the uh, the Watergate scandal, you know, and the way and the way that Nixon in, engaged his opponents. I mean, it isn't in the same league as Trump, but it's got some of the some of the same characteristics. So I think we have there is a danger that we say, oh, you know, this is a this is the time of times. But I think there is something about Trump, this combination of his sort of the way that he operates. I mean, that no other no other president. Um, just simply because they didn't have the facility, uh, you know, has, has been able to be the, you know, make his pronouncements so public in the way that that Trump does with Twitter. We've never seen a presidency do that, but then we've never had the conditions in place for the for a presidency to do that. We've never really seen someone who has so little respect for the institutions of democracy. Hmm. Um, but one thing, and I think one thing that is interesting, we won't know, we won't know this until. Trump is no longer president, whether that's tomorrow, whether it's in a week's time or whether it's in four weeks, time, uh, four years time. We just have mm -hmm. no idea about how robust the institutions are. I mean, he hasn't been able to do everything he's wanted to do. He's dismantled certain way, traditional ways of doing things. But, it, but you know, there has been kickback from mm 
states from other institutions within American democracy. So this is really an interesting test about the robustness of the political system. But there are aspects of it that you know do worry me about the sort of polarization. And some of that, again, is to do with, I think, to do with the kinds of um, ways that people communicate about politics. I mean, one of the problems that we see about around uh, democratic politics now is the, is the sort of polarization where you, you kind of talk to people like yourself and throw bricks at those people. I mean, metaphorical bricks, sometimes actual bricks, uh, you know, sort of uh, to those who don't agree with you. And that space for sort of the kind of politics that I'm much more interested in of talking across difference and with difference rather than against difference, mm. that, that worries me. That worries me about you know, that that's becoming institutionalized. But again, it's really hard to make that judgment when you're living it. It's something we're gonna to have to look in a few years time back is to see whether or not this was the kind of critical moment that many of us think it, it may well be. So you come across in terms of uh, the internet and this polarization of views that we're seeing at the moment, is there a place for the internet in democracy or is it always going to be a negative influence like we're seeing it at the moment? Oh, I don't, I don't think it's as simple to say it's a negative influence. I think mm. as, with, as with any sort of institutional developments, it's got democratic possibilities and democratic and, and the potential to undermine democracy. There's a nice um, piece that I, uh, that I like by David Runciman, the Cambridge um, political philosopher who talks about Facebook being one and, the, one and the same time the most democratic thing we've seen mm -hmm. and the most authoritarian. And what he means by that is, you know, the, the capacity for millions of people to connect with each other in ways that they couldn't possibly connected before. But this is a, this is a um, platform that is run by one or a small number of people who get to choose how you do that. And that reflects back to your point around polarization is the way that Facebook algorithms work is you, you hear from people like yourself, your views mm. are reinforced. So there's a sense in which polarization has always existed in politics and we can't pretend that it, it hasn't, but the, 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 the way that popular platforms work on the, on the internet means that actually that gets intensified. And so polarization is, is a feature of the kinds of, um, the kinds of popular applications like, um, like Facebook, like Twitter. And that, that, we also have to remember the kinds of people, the kinds of polarization we're seeing that aren't representative of all people. There's a particular mm. types of people who are active on that. And they're given much more space, much more uh, capacity to act than they would have been in a pre-digital world. At the same time, you know, I've seen really interesting developments using digital applications in order to bring people together across, uh, you know, across opposing viewpoints and to develop really interesting collective judgments. A lot of this is about how you design the space. So say Facebook and Twitter are not designed as democratic spaces. They are spaces that generate certain democratic outcomes, but we can create um, online spaces which have really, really interesting de democratic dynamics, positive democratic dynamics from my perspective. So that's something I wanted to actually ask you about. And I know we've discussed this in the past before. So we talk about, um, you talk about these things not being uh, as, as well constructed as they could be for democratic representation of people. So how do we do this better online? Because I think I'm safe to say the internet's going to be sticking with us for a while. <laughs> so yes. maybe we need to use it better. How do we have these conversations in a better way then? Unless I can find the off switch, then maybe. <laughs> <we can go. laughs> um, yeah, I mean, let's go back to what I was saying about Facebook. I mean, Facebook was not designed for, demo for its democratic capacities. Its affordances are, you know, to, to, to make money for its creators. You know, it, it, it's, got a, it's got a commercial logic to it rather than a democratic logic. So we can create democratic spaces in all sorts of different ways. I mean, I've seen people who previously would have done engagement face to face who have been forced by the using the forced by coronavirus to actually be on be, be online. And they're doing, um, you know, they're doing kind of Zoom calls in the same way that we're doing at the moment with with tens of with tens of people, with hundreds of people, you know, using the kind of facilities and affordances that Zoom has in order to have very rich conversations. I've done projects myself where we've looked at alternatives to these kind of discussion boards that are deeply problematic because they kind of generate abuse between individuals and also ideas disappear as new, new ideas are put on there. And there's all sorts of ideas of all sorts of uh, platforms emerging that represent arguments in very different ways where 
argument where, where you can build argument maps rather than taking on individuals. You know, you're actually trying collectively to construct ideas. These things are out there. The, pro the problem they face is that, you know, that we've got incumbents. Facebook and Twitter, Instagram and others are where people like to go. And so it's very hard when you develop this really, you know, people develop these really impressive platforms. Driving the traffic to them is the, is, is, how you, is, is the big question. So, you know, motivating people to engage with these platforms. So we've got to do a lot of work, I think, and some of this is regulatory. I actually think governments need to do work here as well, is actually regulating this space, creating a, a more level playing field for different types of applications. And for our politics, actually doing things through digital applications where and when that's the suitable way of doing things. I don't want to think that all politics can go online, all politics could be digital, because I actually think we miss something about the, I think we all realise this actually through coronavirus, we're missing each other. And actually politics is, I, I really think people are missing each other in political spaces as well. Okay, so we've got a, a situation where our, our current framework isn't the best it could be. And, but, and we may need to re, um, rework that to better have these conversations. I really like this idea of argument maps of better displaying uh, conversations between people. Because like you say, I can't see any argument being solved by uh, people saying, I'm right, you're wrong, no, you're an idiot. And I'm sure that's just the, the opposite of how we have a conversation between grown-ups sometimes. Uh, that's probably not going to lead anywhere. So if we were to, to move towards this kind of uh, system, you kind of mentioned you think it needs some sort of government regulatory framework in place. Do we need like a, a central system or a revamp of how government engages with people or what's our way forward here yeah i mean I, i'm not trying to say that yeah what i'm what i was thinking about the regulation of of spaces like facebook and you know and and, and twitter there um i i think there are all sorts of really interesting institutional institutions we can develop with a with a digital component or fully fully digital i think the 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 it's about our creativity and so and, and i'll give you an example from um from my my work pre pre COVID, where we did it, where I've been working a lot with citizens assemblies, which are randomly selected bodies, and you know that that motivates people to engage in those bodies by you know literally sending invitations, you know trying to trying to get a well actually achieving a a sample of people that looks like the broader population. There's no reason why you can't do that sort of thing online, and we are actually doing that sort of thing online. So so there are ways. What I, what I'm trying to suggest is that is that we need to find other ways of doing politics, which aren't simply um, the kind of just, just about electoral ballot, you know, who wins in the ballot box and aren't simply people shouting at each other on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever, and actually create different types of spaces where we, we have a much more constructive politics. And I think we know we can do that. We know we have the capacity to do that. It's about whether or not we have the democratic willingness of our, of, elected elected officials and the kind of pressure from citizens citizen, citizen pressure to actually see a different type of politics emerge i think that as i say i think we know how to do that kind of politics it's about whether or not those people with vested interests in the system uh, are willing to see that change so that's really interesting actually your work you mentioned this idea of um, citizens assemblies yeah uh, for people who aren't aware what a citizens assembly is so what are they exactly yeah, I mean, if, if people have come across citizens assemblies as an, as an idea, that they, they probably have heard of the Irish citizens assembly and the Irish citizens assembly uh, was charged with a number of, it was, it, was, it was tasked with a number of issues, one of which was to look at the constitutional status of abortion. And so about three or four years ago, um, Ireland changed its constitution based on a recommendation from a citizens assembly. So that was one of the major effects that citizen assembly has had and the uk and france have just had climate assemblies and they've been in the news so people might have heard this idea talked about um, and and the, the the key idea the, two, the idea of this is twofold one is um, you bring together a random selection of citizens you you send out invitations massive amount of thousands of invitations to people people respond as to whether they're interested or not and from that group of people who are interested you stratify your sample to make sure that you have the same number of um, same number of men and women is in the wider population, same number of people in terms of age, 
reflect in terms of ethnicity, in terms of social class, in terms of geography. So you, you've got a group of people that have the, di the rough diversity of the broader population. And what you've done with random selection there is you've kind of, you've removed the kind of vested interests, you've removed the kind of electoral dynamics. And this is why the, this is to be honest, why the um, Athenians originally used random selection was to get away from warring families and find a different way of, 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 making, of, of making decisions. And so you combine that random selection with facilitated deliberation. You bring people together. They learn about the issue under question. They uh, deliberate with each other and they come up with sets of recommendations. And this can be over a series of weekends. And that's the idea behind a citizens assembly. So in the last two or three years, we've seen a lot of these, a number of these emerge. The climate assemblies, assemblies around, you know, the, the Irish assembly around abortion, around same sex marriage. But there's actually a fifth, there's been 50 years of practice on this, going right back to the 1970s in America and in, um, and in Germany, where they invented these ideas like citizens juries and planning cells, which have exactly the same logic. And we're just seeing them operating at a sort of higher level of governance. Now, for me, these are interesting in two, for two reasons. One is they, they, they show that citizens are willing and able to engage with the most difficult issues and it willing and able to, to engage with people very unlike themselves. So there's a kind of, it shows us that politics can be done differently. And that, that can feed in really important ideas into the policy process. And that secondly, it kind of gives us an idea that we could create democratic institutions in different ways. It isn't just simply about once every four years, putting your, uh, putting your ballot in the ballot box. There are ways of constructing politics such that citizens are much more involved in the decisions that affect their lives. So I kind of like, like this kind of, I'm very interested in this kind of politics, both in a practical sense of how's it affecting democracy now, but also that idea that this gives us a vision for how democracy could be organized as we, as we move forward. A lot of this is to do with institutional design. So there are, diff, you know, as I said, that's one way of creating an institution, you know, through random selection deliberation. There are other ways of doing it, like through, through referendums. They have their advantages, they have their disadvantages. And I think, one thing is we kind of inherited a political system from the 19th century and it hasn't really changed very much. And this system of kind of, you know, kind of uh, uh, political parties, electoral politics, uh, legislatures, we've kind of, that, that stayed with us. We've, in, we've increased the franchise, obviously, but, you know, politics and the kind of issues we face have changed over time, whereas our, our institutions are, are reasonably recognisable over time. I think actually... Mm -hmm. Where we, what we need to be looking at is innovating those institutions and, and thinking about democracy in a more creative way. Just increasing who can vote, just, just increasing the franchise to, to, to empower more people to vote is not what democracy is about. I mean, it's one aspect of it, but actually, you know, it, democracy is about political equality. It's about popular control. It's about trying to develop considered judgments. And, and that that is not just about electoral democracy. So, so for people like me, it's about you know, evidence-based, looking at, looking at what works under what conditions and trying to think about how we can reshape our political system. And, and the University mentioned... of Westminster pays me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so you mentioned this idea of um, them being more considered and you mentioned consensus. I mean, heaven forbid we find consensus in partisan politics these days. So that sounds really positive. I don't think I said consensus. Oh, excuse I, me. Sorry. Have to play. No, don't worry. I think I certainly said considered judgments. Yeah. So I, I don't think you're necessarily going to get agreement, a hundred you okay. know, kind of total agreement in these in these processes. Mm -hmm. But what you do is you find you find where people agree about ways forward. You understand mm -hmm. you you understand where there are differences of opinion and. So and, and, and in the development, one of the interesting developments that I've seen in, in Poland with these is that mayor, municipal mayors have agreed to run these assemblies and said that they will implement any decision that has 80 percent or more support from within the, within the assembly. They guarantee to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's not consensus, but it's much closer to mm -hmm. consensus than than we would see traditionally with a, you know, 50.1 percent of the vote kind of thing. So these are spaces in within which people develop collaboratively develop ideas. And I think that's, that's something which we don't really see enough in our politics. Yeah, I, I, I do understand that point. And so you've been involved in a number of these over the years, these citizens assemblies, yep. uh, and have made a bit of a name, I think, being involved in them. <laughs> uh, so one of the ones I saw that was really interesting and um, 
speaking of politics in the UK in the last few years, yeah. is you did a citizens' assembly on Brexit. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Okay. So that I mean that was a really interesting project, and it and it was it was we instigated it for two reasons. Um, one was because we just had the Brexit vote, and we want and our feeling was the Brexit vote didn't tell you what Brexit should look like. So what we wanted to do was to bring together a group of citizen, a randomly selected group of citizens and ask them, OK, what would you like to see in terms of um, in terms of our, our relationship with the EU and economic relationship with the EU and also in terms of immigration? And we did it for, for because we wanted to contribute to the policy debates, but also because we wanted to show that citizens assemblies work in the UK. There'd been quite significant developments in Ireland, in Canada, in Australia, but that kind of. UK exceptionalism kicked in and said, well, it can't possibly happen here. And we thought, OK, we will show you this can be done by. So it's a demonstration project by choosing the most controversial issue of our time. So we we made sure that we had 52 percent of our participants were had voted leave and 48 percent had voted remain. And for many of them, it was the first time they had a conversation with someone who had actually uh, voted differently. Now. Unfortunately, and we can talk about why it didn't, but it didn't have impact on policy in the way we hoped. But what it did do was establish that citizens' assemblies work. And one of the things it did in the UK now is the people that we worked with, which was Involve, which is a, a participation charity, they then ran a citizens' assembly on social care for two parliamentary, uh, parliamentary committees. They then ran, uh, they did then more recently run the UK Climate Assembly. And I think there's a clear relationship to the fact that we did this pilot project an academic pilot project actually led to significant change in the way that we do participatory politics in the UK. It's something I'm really, actually, to be honest, really proud of the fact that we can do an academic piece of research that can then have that kind of profound impact on, on thinking about participatory politics. It is actually quite cool. You're right. Um, like, <laughs> Thank you. Because uh, when I was, I was originally pitching these, the ideas of, of this um, season's podcast guests, and I mentioned to someone, we're going to interview a professor of the study of democracy. And they went, well, what do you study about democracy? You know, you vote, someone wins. What's there to understand? <laughs> like, I think it's more complicated than that, but I'm not really sure how. <laughs> um, it, there must have been some contentious discussions, though, wouldn't there? Oh, gosh, yes. But, but um, these are facilitated. So you bring, you bring, imagine, you bring 50 people into a room. If you just left them there... Good goodness knows what happens. The most confident people would the com would win out. The, you know, it would be it would be havoc. But these are very these are facilitated spaces where people operate on a table with maybe sort of eight to ten other people um, with a with a trained facilitator. They they kind of learn about issues. They deliberate about issues. That's then reflected back to the plenary. Comes back to tables. I mean, they're they're carefully designed processes. So of course there was disagreement. And I remember one of the if you go and look at the the findings on on the on the Citizens Assembly on Brexit website, what you'll see is actually they were, they were more progressive than you might expect. So people wanted a closer relationship to the EU. They, they actually were quite supportive of immigration on, but, but, you know, under certain conditions. And there were people in that room who, are, who I would classify as, to, to want to a better phrase, borderline racist. And you, wouldn't, you would expect that out of a random selection of people. And I was talking to and one, of the, one of the women afterwards who'd been very vociferous in her views about immigration. And I said to her, you know, you, know, you didn't, you know, the, the, the outcome was not as you wanted. She said, she said, no, but that's fine because I was able to articulate my views. We went through a process of learning and I can see why we came to the, you know, why the assembly came to the recommend recommendations it came to. I, I didn't, my, my view didn't, wasn't the one that was accepted, but I had the opportunity to, act, to present my views and it was quite clear to me why why the assembly came to the views it did and that struck me as my god how often does that happen in democracy how much how often does that happen in politics so so that's why i i find these processes exciting i find them exciting just purely from a research perspective what happens when people are brought together they're given equal space to deliberate they're facilitated what happens to this kind of diverse group of people but it's more than that for me. It actually makes me realise that democracy could be different, that democracy could be organised differently, that we can create these spaces, that we don't need to hurl bricks at, hurl, um, you know, sort of uh, bricks at each other, whether that's just verbal or whether it's physical, physical, in, you know, we can actually engage in, in, 
across difference in a way that is respectful, in a way that helps us understand the other's position and come out with judgments that are accepted by others. Not accepted in the sense that I, I agree with that, but I agree with the process by which we came to that decision. Does, does that make sense, Bradley? Oh, it does. And it's, it sounds like a beautiful idea. <laughs> and I don't mean to sound pessimistic when I put it like that, because it does. It sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, I guess the issue becomes those 50 people walk away saying, my voice was heard and I feel better about that. But there's 72 point something million other yeah. British United Kingdom citizens going, well, that's nice for them. But it's an yeah, interesting so, way of doing representation, so that, isn't it? No, no, and I get, it is. It is. And we must recognize it's a different, it is a different way of doing representation. Um, but there is a, you know, there's a now research stream emerging around what do the broader public think of these sorts of institutions? And it's quite clear that they have more trust in and more confidence in these institutions than they do elected officials and elected institutions. So, these these are these have the potential to be quite trusted and um, you know respected uh, institutions which people could be confident in. Now the question is that's based on these on quite a small number of instances. There has been a, a bit of a wave of these things. Um, you know, in the last two or three years, they've really taken off. Lots of local assemblies as well, but they're really not a standard part of the democratic toolkit yet, if you like. They're not part of the democratic infrastructure, you know, established and institutionalized. And it, the interesting question is over time, would, would that trust still be there or would people not like them so much because they're coming up with decisions that aren't necessarily the same as they, I was involved and I, I was really glad to be involved in a process in East Belgium, which is a German speaking, the German speaking province of Belgium. They have a small parliament and they've now established a, uh, a permanent citizens council, which itself decides on what assemblies are going to be run and this is a piece of infrastructure that a group of sort of experts like myself from around the world came to the, the parliament said we want to do something innovative here what could we do and we came up with this idea and they've institutionalized it and it's those sorts of developments you think okay that's a space to watch that's that's where it starts to get interesting that is it's, it's so cool and then um just to, to switch topics slightly, heaven forbid we have a conversation these days without mentioning the word COVID-19, I guess. Mm, mm. But uh, I see you're working on a project to do with public engagements uh, with COVID-19 in short and long term. So bringing these two ideas together about citizens assemblies and the COVID-19 response. Tell us about that. Yeah, actually, actually there's, uh, there's, there's two projects, one of which I've just been funded from, from, the, one of, from the diversity and inclusion research community. Um, and I shall start with that one. And, that, and that's looking at, we have all this work on citizens assemblies and suddenly COVID hits and suddenly it's all have to go online. We've got to run online, online citizens assemblies. So I'm really interested in what happens to the dynamic of an assembly when you move it online. So I've done all this research on offline assemblies. Tell me, you know, I, I don't know what kinds of ex inclusions and exclusions do we experience when we do it in an online format. And my that I, my early findings from talking to some of the practitioners is that actually not have participated face-to-face -face are actually willing to do it online. Some people who would be more dominant face-to-face -face are actually less dominant online. So there's, I, I think there's some really interesting things to be learned about this kind of, we, we, something we ha were forced into actually doing, moving democratic practice online. So that's one project which I'm, which I'm involved in and which I'm very excited about. The other one is working with the charity involved that I mentioned mentioned earlier. And what we're doing there is we, we, we've done two things. One is we produce some guidance to local authorities about how they might do public engagement during COVID. But the other thing which I think is really exciting and I, and I would really recommend listeners to go and, um, and viewers to go and have a look at is that we're curating a blog series of views about participation and democracy during COVID. And the, the rationale for this is that there is, you know, the original sort of discourse around COVID was it's going to be the great leveller. We're all in this together. But actually, our experience is this is completely not the case. First of all, certain communities are exposed because of their jobs, whether they're in the health industry or whether they're in gig economy or whatever, you know, very different experience. Our lived experience is different because of, you know, I'm, you know some people live in a space as big as my office. You know, that's their, that's, that's their living space. Um, you know, so they've got they don't have any outside space. That's a very different experience. And so some people living with mental health problems, etc. So we, what we wanted to do was to was to make the case for participation and deliberation, but hear that from all sorts of different angles. And over the last week, for example, we've had a blog 
which has been put up by a couple of um, academics who, who are from the deaf community. And they've been talking about how challenging it is to think about engagement when we're talking, when people are wearing masks and when people are, when people are engaged over Zoom and you, know, you get these very, you know, very small blocks, of, blocks of, of image. And they were just saying they're really worried about how their hard won rights may actually be regressing during this period. We've um, had contributions about how do you think long-term about the future? And so a lovely blog up there about future councils in, um, in uh, Japan where they get dressed up ceremonially and imagine them in ceremonial robes and imagine themselves in 50 or 60 years to or imagine Japanese people in 50 or 60 years time and think about how would they like to live and how can we get from there to here and all these kinds of ideas that we're seeing. So it's been a really exciting space for people to talk about what de what deliberation and participation means to them in the times of COVID and it's been really great because you tend to, and we've talked about this already, you tend to live in your own bubble. So my little bubble of participation at the moment tends to be lots of people talking about citizens' assemblies. But now I'm being exposed to ideas from people who are working on poverty commissions, people working, you know, how do you, how do you engage the poor, poor people systematically to engage with the question of, you know, sort of structural questions of poverty? Now that's, you know, that's not a citizens' assembly. That's a completely different way of doing things. And, uh, you know, the, the, lovely, the lovely quote, I think it's at the top of the blog was some things are so challenging that they can't be done quickly. You know, this idea that or some things are so, so uh, no, some things are so urgent that, they, that they, we can't do them quickly. You know, so, and so there, you know, there, there are some really interesting ideas out there. And so we're trying to curate and host this variety of perspectives on what democracy, what a democratic response to COVID-19 might look like. We, you know, I can't. I have no idea where this is going to go in terms of will it have impact, but actually hearing these voices and being able to sort of amplify these voices is really important to me in terms of in terms of trying to think about a different type of politics. It's almost really interesting to me coming to this topic for, as an outsider that we keep coming back to this idea of bubbles and people sticking in communities and trying to break them out and have different conversations, ironically. Uh, the, the title of our podcast, Different Conversations. Yeah, okay, got, got that but, one in uh, there. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting that, that that just comes up again and again and again. Yeah, and, and when you say different conversations, you know, my, my point, and I've said it a couple of times already in this, mm. in this interview, in this discussion, is this idea of converse, not just different conversations, but conversations across difference. Mm. And, I, and, and, you know, one of my real concerns about democratic politics as we experience it at the moment is... The, the way that I already mentioned this, we already talked about the filter bubbles on Facebook, et cetera, but also the way that political parties now through their, through, through their use of digital data are able to sort of target, micro target people. Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me that political debates are very different from they used to, what they used to be because they had to be much more public because you had to, you know, you, you didn't know who you could persuade, but now you can actually kind of target the kind of people who are more likely to support your message and target those people who you don't want to vote for you with weight with kind of advertisements that might suppress their vote so you know it just strikes me that this is not what democracy is meant to look like this is this is a kind of a competitive elitism between kind of two two or three parties who are using sort of digital techniques to to kind of you know undermine or you know undermine the support of other parties of course we used to see that before but it's just happening at a kind of concentration and speed that is so different from before and so, that, you know, for me, it's, you know, my work, if it's anything, is trying to think about how do we open up those different conversations or those conversations across difference that actually look, make democracy look different from it is now. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I say that as a, um, my day job is a boring life scientist, a molecular biologist. This is so, so cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah, no, but I'm just, but, but just going to say that, you know, I, I, which, which one of us is more likely to help solve the COVID problem as a scientific, you know, <laughs> at, in, it's, it isn't me putting, putting, curating a blog series. <laughs> You've got a book I hear that's about to be released, Can yeah, yeah, Democracy right. Safeguard the Future? So briefly, yeah. tell us about that. Um, it actually picks up on a lot of the things we've been talking about. Mm. The, the, the book starts from the kind of premise that democracies are, are, are not very good at thinking long term, you know, issues like climate change, like pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm that we've just experienced you now, like health, health and social care, its response to emerging technologies like nanotechnology and AI. Democracies tend to think too much in the short term. There's an, and so I talk about the driver, you know, I look at the drivers of this, the kind of problems of 
electoral cycles, entrenched interests, lack of presence of future generations. Um, and then I start to think, okay, what would it what would it take for democracy to develop institutions that were more long sighted? So I look at how we might reform parliaments, so committees for um, future future generations. One which exists in I look at the committee that exists in in um, Finland. I look at the use of um, uh, constitutional uh, constitutional uh, amendments and co the constitutions to actually protect future generations. And we're seeing organizations like Client Earth challenging government decisions on the basis of the effect that they will have on future generations. I look at commissioners for future generations, Wales, just down the road from us. Wales has got a commissioner for future generations who is empowered to work with public authorities in order to in integrate long-term thinking within decision-making. And again, I look at the kind of mini publics, the sort of citizens assemblies and citizens juries that we've been talking about today and how they also allow a long-term thinking that isn't possible within electoral politics. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at the way that democracy actually has a, has a problem here, but also think about the institutional solutions that may, that may uh, emerge as well. And The Great Virtue, it's a really short book. <laughs> no, Quick not read. a short book because it's not a short book because there's not a lot to say, but it's a short book because it's in a short book series. <laughs> I've got to admit, if I ever wrote a book, it'd be very short. It sounds hard. <laughs> You know, it's, I think it's harder to write a short, a good short book than it is a long book because with a long book you can ramble on, and you, you know, with a short book you've got to choose what's in and what's out. So, I actually found it a really productive discipline to be told, mm -hmm. look, you've only got, I think this was thirty thousand words. You, that's what you've got. Whereas previous books have been eighty, ninety thousand words and much more verbose. Here you have to be really clear. Do I really need to say that? So, I, I actually actually really like it. I'm I'm going to be really interested to see how how my colleagues take it because it's not. It hasn't got the, it's got a different feel to it. So we'll, we'll see. Brilliant. All right. Uh, unfortunately, that's probably about all we've got time for today. So I'll say thank you, Graham, for joining us. And, and I'll say thank uh, you, Bradley, for inviting me. <laughs> I'd like to thank Professor Graham Smith for being with us today. If you've enjoyed our, our podcast today, uh, don't forget to subscribe. My name's Brad Elliott, and this has been Different Conversations. <laughs>